Welcome to today's 3D print. Um, I wanted to talk about something today that's, um, I'm releasing this video Thursday night, Friday morning, because I don't want this to interfere with my normal video schedule. I do have a video coming out on the Anycubic Wash and Cure Station on Saturday morning, so stay tuned for that. But I thought this was something important, because I'd like to give this guy some attention if I can, too. Um, you guys know I made, some of you may know I made these little dice boxes. Um, you know, I, uh, I actually didn't design um, this exact model. I have one I did design, same exact thing. I made it in Tinkercad, but um, um, I kind of um, am pushing for support of it. Well, anyway, I released this file on Thingiverse. It's free to the world. Anybody can use it. Um, I don't mind when other people make it or even sell it because, well, I don't own the hexagon. You know, the hexagon is a basic shape of nature. This the beehives use this, um, crystal formation uses this, and there even mathematicians and in, in industry packing standards use this. It's called HCP, hexagon compressed packing. Um, this is what's called a tessellation. Okay, a tessellation is when you have a polygon with other polygons around it that fit face to face. Okay, so you notice how there's a minimum amount of space in between each hexagon. There is no other way to fit these hexagons in this space. If I rotate these hexagons at any angle whatsoever except face to face, this box becomes larger. Okay, so this is the only way to maximize efficiency of of the seven hexagons inside of a hexagon. It's called a tessellation. Um, the industry calls it HCP, hexagon compressed packing, or something like that. It's a pretty standardized thing. So. What happened, <coughs> there's a company called Elderwood Academy, and they make some, I'll bet, gorgeous boxes. They make a wooden version of this. Um, I personally don't think their box is mechanically as nice as mine. I think mine's mechanically superior, um, but cosmetically, theirs is beautiful. I mean, we're talking inlaid wood, beautiful carving. I mean, it's gorgeous. It's a, it's a genuinely gorgeous product. If it weren't for this whole situation, I'd probably buy one. <laughs> Now you couldn't pay me to own one. So, they issued a DMCA takedown saying that they owned a sculptural copyright, their words, not mine, um, for the seven hexagon tessellation. They didn't call it a seven hexagon tessellation and they wouldn't even if they knew what that was because then they'd be admitting that they couldn't possibly own this. But anyway, this arrangement of hexagons. Now, the DMCA is interesting the way it works, <coughs> because the DMCA actually gives me some power. It sounds very threatening when you read it, and a lot of people back off immediately when there's any kind of a DMCA takedown, because it's, some of the wording is very threatening sounding. You know, if you fraudulently file a DMCA counter notice, you could have prison time, and you can have fines, and stuff like that, but... Most people don't realize it really has to be intentional. I mean, you, just because you say, no, I'm legit, doesn't mean you're going to jail and getting sued. That's not how it works. Um, as, as bad as the DMCA is, and it's a bad law, it's unconstitutional, that part of it's actually pretty reasonable. So the DMCA says that if I file a counter, if, if in order to maintain safe harbor status, if... Elderwood issues a DMCA takedown request to MakerBot, the owners of Thingiverse. They have to comply. Okay, That's how they maintain their safe harbor status, so that MakerBot can't be sued for me posting copyrighted material to Thingiverse. So Now, that process says that I can dispute it. I can say, file a counter notice and say, uh, no, this does not violate your copyright. And it doesn't. They don't have a copyright. We'll get to that. Uh, their, their DMCA takedown was fraudulent, and their application to MakerBot was fraudulent, and they knew it, and they did it maliciously. I'll get to that in a minute. So, they have 10 days. Once I file my counter notice with MakerBot, it actually took um, 11 days, actually. It actually took 22 days, because I sent it to the wrong email address. <laughs> I waited 11 days and said, hey, MakerBot, oh, we never got your reply. Oh, crap, I sent it to, you know, MakerBot, or I sent it to um, DMCA at, you know, www.makerbot.com instead of MakerBot.com, so it went to the wrong place. So I sent it to the right place. Now, once I file a counter notice, Elderwood has two choices and only two choices. Let it go or file court paperwork to sue me. If they file court paperwork to sue me and provide that court paperwork to MakerBot, MakerBot will keep the files taken down. 
If they do not file that paperwork within 11 days, MakerBot is clear, they are protected in their safe harbor protection, and they release my files back to being available. They did that. That was over a year ago. So um, I figured, okay, good. And, oh, 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 it gets better. <laughs> oh, it gets better. One of you guys, I couldn't find. The, the, when, when, a, when MakerBot replied to me, they said, well, here's what they provided for proof. And they provided some USPTO, United States Patent and Trademark Office, documentation numbers, you know, docket numbers. I couldn't find them. Well, there's a reason I couldn't find them. Because it wasn't approved. <laughs> the docket number, which one of you guys found for me, thank you very much, was actually the rejection letter from the USPTO that said, um, hello, McFly, you can't own basic shapes. <laughs> you can't claim ownership of the, ta of the hexagon. Okay? Even if you were to make something like a dragon that was made up of hexagons, you still don't own the hexagons. You only own a dragon made of hexagons. Okay? So you can't own basic shapes. You can't, you know, file a, a copyright for the hexagon or the circle or the isocahedron or the, you know, octagon or square cube, whatever. You can't, you can't own basic shapes. It's, 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 it's a fundamental part of nature. It's not distinctive. You can't own that. It has to, it has to be novel in some way. Um, and it can't be functional. Basic shapes are functional. So I figured it was all over. They, they, they basically, they were just going around threatening people with fraudulent paperwork because they obviously have to know what that document says when they went to the USPTO and copied it and sent it to people and said, hey, they're copying our work. Take down their files. Um, they have to know that that letter is a rejection letter uh, unless they're so stupid they didn't even read it. Um, so they were, did this maliciously and fraudulently. They were abusing the system. They knew they couldn't get a patent because there's too much prior art. I mean, I was making these things 25 years ago in Woodshop. And there were people making these things before I was born, okay? This is a very old design. This is not new. And for gaming, you know, people were making these things for dice, you know, for 40, 50 years. Longer even for other industries. So, um, they can't get a patent. Prior art. They also can't get a copyright because it's a basic shape. Which is why they tried their sculptural copyright BS. They keep trying to say, well, you know, the shape up here and the combination of the shape here. They're trying to make it sound like it's something special when it's just, well, the, well these half diamonds here. Um, well, that's just the leftover space when you make a seven hexagon tessellation instead of a hexagon. That's automatic. You're always going to have those diamonds if you make this kind of a configuration. It's an automatic part of that. It's function. So, a year goes by <coughs> and my files get taken down again. Now, I don't know exactly when, Thingiverse doesn't tell you, one of my viewers sent me a message, hey, your files are gone again. And I went and checked, and sure enough, files were gone again. But this time, they did it a little differently. They didn't use the DMCA. Um, instead, this time, they just declared copyright violation of their trade dress. So they claimed to have a trademark for this, which you can't do. I'll get to that in a minute. Um... Somebody at the, you know, if I was Gibbs, I'd be probably smacking somebody at the USPTO because it never should have been approved. Anyway, this process is a little different. You see, I can't dispute this process. There's literally nothing someone in my position that a regular Joe citizen can do to dispute this process. Now you say, well, wait a minute. Can't you oppose the trademark? Well, yes, I can. But regular Joe citizen is not allowed to oppose the trademark. Not unless they pay a $400 filing fee just to file the opposition and hire a lawyer. <laughs> um, the lawyer we have, I'll get to how that happened in a minute because I want to make sure you guys know about these people because they're amazing, um, said that depending on the USPTO's response and depending on how hard Elderwood fights and some other variables, this could go up to $30,000. I make twelve grand a year to pay for me and my sister. Where the hell am I going to get $30,000 plus four hundred dollars <laughs> to file it? I can't. There's nothing I could do about that. So this entire process is designed to exclude regular citizens from the process, even though it affects us regular citizens. They're taking down my files. Um, well, I was a little annoyed, and somebody posted something about something being taken down for copyright violation, and I was like, well, tell Thingiverse why you're at to release my files. <laughs> And, um, you know, Leonard, a uh, guy named Leonard French 
who has a website called The Lawful Masses. I'll have a link down below in the description for that. You really need to check him out. Um, even if you don't participate, it's fascinating some of the videos he posts it's because he, he goes into all the court documents and stuff like that and gives a legal opinion on it as a lawyer. Um, he saw that message and was curious and looked into it and asked me a couple questions and said, maybe I can help. <laughs> so let me explain, before we get back to the dice box again, because so there's more, but let me explain about lawful masses. Um, Leonard, if you watch this, correct me um, wherever I make a mistake. But the basic understanding I've, I have of this is that you, there's, there's, there's a problem in our society called access to justice. Where, hey, psst, get down, or I'll kick your butt. The cat's trying to get to the giant light that I have producing all this light. <laughs> and they'd like to tear apart the Venetian blinds as they try to get to it. So anyway, <coughs> sorry, access to justice, where people like me do not have access to justice because the cost of entry is so high, the barrier of entry is so high, where am I going to get $30,400? <laughs> Hell, where am I going to get $400? I mean, even if I didn't go a lawyer, if I went pro se and filled out the form myself, which probably would not work, cat, I'm going to throw something at you. Get down. <laughs> ah, now you're going to fall, you dummy. <laughs> I threw a little tube at him. And now he's going to chase the tube. <laughs> so you got to distract him. Give him something else to go after. Um, so I basically will, don't have access to this system. Um, his entire premise is crowdfunding access to justice. He has a viewer base, obviously some of them quite wealthy, um, who agree with this philo philanthropic approach to access to justice. So when he sinks his teeth into a subject, he'll make a video about it. And after consulting some lawyer friends, if he thinks it's feasible to fight, he will start a GoFundMe. Now that GoFundMe, um, it's in his name and my name, but I get nothing. You know, it's, it's, it's for my initiative, because since I am the one who has standing, because my box is being taken down, all the legal paperwork has to be filed in my name. So they're representing me. Uh, they can't file the paperwork because they don't have standing. I have standing since I am being materially affected by their application. So they are basically sponsoring me. They're, um, what do you call it? Um, they're my lawyers, I guess you'd call it. Um, I guess that really what it is what it is. Um, but none of that money goes to me. That's all for paying legal fees, you know, so they use that to pay the $400, the $100 extension, and the initial whatever it was to pay the lawyer to do this initial, and you know, research and whatnot to see if we have a go or not, and she thinks we do. She thinks we're golden to go forward with it. Um, they provided a settlement offer. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about those details, so I'm not going to, but it was, it was bullshit. Um, basically me suck their dick. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, his entire premise is that he has GoFundMes, and probably lots of them, and his viewer base, like you guys are my viewer base, well his viewer base, they enjoy helping to provide this access to justice. So if his viewers agree with this concept and like where it's going, they donate to these GoFundMes and he uses that money to hire lawyers and do whatever is necessary to help people with cases like this. And that is phenomenal. He has literally created a YouTube channel and a crowdfunding system to support access to justice. How freaking awesome is that? <laughs> I sure appreciate it. You know, every step of the way I'm saying, if you think we're okay to go forward, let's go forward. Because I don't want to just say, yes, it's not my money. You know, so you tell me, do you think we have a case? That if so, then I say, let's go. And, um, but, um, that's what he does. And that's amazing. You guys really need to check out his channel and watch some of his videos. The, uh, the video he just did of the, um, uh, the class action case of 5,000 um, 
uh, DoorDash drivers. It was awesome. He, he didn't do anything with it as far as a GoFundMe, but he went over the court documents and explained stuff to us as viewers. And it's fascinating stuff. I mean, I, I probably watch one or two of his videos a week. It's just great fun to watch his videos and just learn about this kind of stuff. And um, what he's doing with this crowdfunding access to justice is amazing. It truly is amazing. So, onward with Elderwood. <laughs> um, they're breaking every single rule the USPTO has for trademarks. Like, literally, they're doing this maliciously and intentionally. What they're doing is criminal and fraudulent, and they know it. This is not a case of, you know, I think I'm right, and I'm trying to make the system work for me, but I'm making a mistake. They know what they're doing is wrong. Some of the things they've done make it clear that they are intentionally trying to manipulate and abuse the system to make it work the way they want it to work. See, what they want is not a trademark protection. They want patent protection. They want to be able to keep anybody else from making a 7-hexagon tessellation dice box. They're not trying to protect a mark. Now, one of the things that the USPTO says is that you can't submit your product as a trademark application. A trademark, that's what patent and copyright is for. Okay, Trademark is to protect that. It's to protect your logo. So the NASA logo, the Stormlight logo, okay, the LG logo, the Anycubic logo, the Wham Bam logo. That's what trademark is for. It's to protect your logo, to protect your mark. Elderwood has a mark. It's the ethereal bird. It's like a three-winged, ethereal, fancy, artistic bird. That's their mark. That's their logo for their company, Elderwood Academy. Go look it up. You'll see what I'm talking about. It's right on their main page. Um... Not only <coughs> did they not submit a trade dress application for a mark or logo, they submitted a trade dress application of that. Literally. Do a black and white line drawing of that exact thing right there, and that's their trade dress application. That it violates the first rule the USPTO has for trade dress. You can't file a trademark for your product. <laughs> You have to file a trademark application for your mark or logo, okay? Not only that, but the drawing they provided of my box, their box too, um, they stripped it of all of their marks and logos. It's just a plain box with nothing on it because they don't want to have a trademark for their logo. They want patent protection for the box design so they can keep anybody else from making a similar box. Now, why don't bigger companies fight them on this? Because it can get expensive. It's like $30,000. <laughs> they even threatened me directly. Directly threatened me through the lawyer. Said they would sue me directly for damages if I proceeded with this. Our lawyer confirmed that they're blowing hot air. That they cannot come after me for following the government opposition process. Um, but um, they even tried that. So a 3D printing example of this trademark issue is... E3D from the UK. Do you know about their new extruder? The Hermes? Oh, wait a minute. No, it's the Hermera. But I thought it was called the Hermes. So why'd they change it to Hermera? For the exact same reason. A company in the UK who's using the Hermes name sent a cease and desist legal letter to E3D saying you can't use the Hermes name. It's ours. We own the trademark to that. First of all, they don't. It's a Greek god. You can't own the trademark to that. And even if they do, it would be restricted. So, for example, um, let's see. Um, uh, what's a good example? Um, so, if I made the Hermes Wallet Company, and I made these wallets that I called the Hermes line of wallets, right? That if I got a trademark for that, it would only apply to this industry. If I made a flashlight called the Hermes Flashlight, that would not be violating the Hermes trademark for the wallets because it's a different industry. There's no confusion, okay? Same thing with E3D making a Hermes hot end. Their trademark would not apply. Now, there is exceptions to that. For example, the McDonald's arches, the Coca-Cola bottle shape, the Disney Mickey logo, okay? Those are trademarks that attain what's called special status, where those trademarks are so absolutely distinctive that anybody in any industry using that mark would create confusion. So if I made a light called the Mouse Light, which is totally fine, and then I put a Mickey Mouse-like logo on it, I would be violating Disney's trademark, even though it's a completely different industry. 
because the Mickey Mouse logo is so absolutely distinctive that people all over the world would assume that I was affiliated with Disney. Okay, That's how distinctive that mark is. So there would be confusion and dilution of their trademark. But that's very hard to get, that special status. But E3D is correct. They are not violating the Hermes trademark. So why'd they change it to Hermera? Because it costs money. They'd have to hire a lawyer and fight it. And depending on how big the other company was, the other company could just bleed E3D, which is a 3D printing company with very thin profit margins. You know, you when you do this kind of stuff, dice boxes and 3D printers, you know, unless you're a big company like any cubic creality, the profit margins are slim. Okay, it's a very niche market. So E3D did not want to risk losing a lot of money just to keep a name. It was easier and significantly cheaper. You know, one consultation with a lawyer is more expensive than just changing the name of the product of Hermera. <laughs> so that's what E3D did. They caved to the bullying because they had to for financial reasons. I can't cave because if I cave, that means I stop making these. <laughs> you know, I can't just rename it. If he was able to design it differently, well, that's capitulation. That's If I change my design, then it's not the same thing anymore. They win. And, um, but that's what's happening. Without lawful masses, there'd be nothing I could do. <laughs> um, to, um, get, and, and, and on top of that, uh, the, the people at Elderwood, they're like little children who were jerking off for the first time and they're ejaculating too fast. Because all they had to do was wait 30 days. All they had to do is shut their goddamn mouths for 30 days and there'd be nothing I could do about it. Because... Opposing a trademark is dramatically easier and cheaper than fighting an established trademark after the opposition period. All they had to do was shut their pie holes for 30 days and wait until the trademark passed the opposition period, and if nobody disputed it, it'd be virtually impossible for me to fight even with lawful masses support. Um, <coughs> they even went so far as to get um, the... There's a process in the trademark process called acquired distinctiveness. If you have a pretty generic trademark, seven hexagons, really, um, you have to show acquired distinctiveness. That you have um, like, uh, um, something like um, something like 3D Solutex little pyramid logo there. Okay, that's naturally distinctive. It's something unique to them. Okay. But something like a hexagon is very generic and simple. There's nothing distinctive about it. But you can acquire distinctiveness. Like um, Chris Taylor's 3D printing channel is not distinctive. Today's 3D print might be. Okay. But Chris Taylor's, you know, Taylor 3D printing is not distinctive. But if I'm in the industry long enough, and any a lot of people in the industry, um, you know, see my logo. Oh, Taylor 3D printing. I know them. That's acquired distinctiveness. They tried to claim they have acquired distinctiveness because they send out review units to people. And those people says, yep, I recognize that. It's an Elderwood box. Well, no shit. You sent them a review unit. <laughs> of course they're going to recognize it. Um, on top of that, they're all carbon copy letters. Basically, Elderwood sent them some key points and said, include this in your letter. And they did. <laughs> um but like E3D, Wormwood is another company that makes this you know, gaming stuff. Um, they capitulated when, when Elderwood threatened them and they changed, they had a box design just like this and they changed it to not violate, to not be similar to Elderwood's box for the same reason E3D did. It's cheaper than fighting. Okay, they've got money. I don't want to waste money and my profit margins, my thin profit margins, trying to fight them even though I know I'm right. So we'll just change the design and that's what they did. Um, so thankfully, Lawful Masses has helped me out with that, which is really amazing. Um, <coughs> um, it's it's just I don't know. It's disgusting. It's it's disgusting that people will abuse the legal system like this because they want it so bad. It's just I don't know. Uh, well, a, a little message to Elderwood. I never intended to sell these. 
this was always just something that was cool and fun. I'll print a couple here and there as gifts for family, and I put it online for other people to make. I made a video showing people how to put, I don't know if I, did I release the video? I think I didn't actually post the video, I think, off the check. But, you know, how to put your own logo on it and stuff like that. You know, how to convert an image into an SVG, extrude it into a 3D model, and cut your own logo. So I downloaded the NASA logo, and I put that on there. Um, but now I want to sell them. <laughs> just because you really pissed me off. <laughs> you just made me mad, so now I want to sell them. So if we win this, I'm going to go hardcore into selling these things, okay? And, you know, um, I would really like to have one that says, fuck Elderwood, but I have a feeling that would just get me in trouble. <laughs> Even though it would be legal, it would be satire, I think that would just get me in trouble. But, um... <laughs> um but that's it. That's the explanation. So one of my viewers asked about this specifically. I'm putting it on today's 3D print because I want to give more viewership to lawful masses i think that site is amazing i think the pro i think what leonard french is doing with it is absolutely amazing um it's it's philanthropy from someone who's not rich and that's amazing he's crowdfunding access to justice philanthropy and that's just freaking awesome check out his channel watch some of his videos that's an explanation of what's going on with this and where we are in that um, I submitted a bunch of information to the lawyer explaining that, you no, know, it's pure function, it's a, it's what's called a tessellation, it's the only way to arrange hexagons without making the box bigger, it's, it's, it is the definition of function, and you can't trademark function, you can only trademark non-functional logos and marks. So hopefully the USPTO will recognize the error of approving such an application and they will reject it. <coughs> And then um, I won't have to worry about hearing from Elderwood again. <laughs> you know, all you guys had to do was shut up and make your boxes. Okay? You, oh, get this. They don't use their submitted trademark logo anywhere in the company. It's not on their business cards. It's not on their flags. It's not on their letterhead. It's not on their website. It's not in any other product they sell whatsoever. They don't use that mark or logo as a mark or logo anywhere in their entire company. None of their other products have it. The only place it's used is inside their dice box. <laughs> as a function. <laughs> they don't use it as a mark or logo anywhere. <laughs> I mean, if that's not proof enough... I don't know what is. I mean, just, you know. Eh, what it is is that it's probably some young guy who got started a Kickstarter and, you know, it took off, which it should have. It's a beautiful box. You know, if, if you'd have just kept your mouth shut, not tried to be king of the world and own something you're not allowed to own, own something you have no right to own, I was making these boxes probably before you were born. <laughs> I'm guessing this guy's t between 20 and 30. I was probably making one of these in the woodshop before he was born. Okay? You can't own the hexagon. All you had to do was shut up and just make a good product. And I probably would have supported you. Your boxes are beautiful. <laughs> go, go check out Elderwood Academy. I mean, I can't suggest you buy them. I think they're assholes. But go check out their products. Their, their dice boxes are uh, stunning. They're gorgeous. They're works of art. You know, the, the the inlays they use and everything. It's just, they really did a nice job making those boxes. And, you know, this is starting to gain enough traction now that they're going to get a bad name in this very small gaming industry. You know, Dungeons and Dragons, Cat and stuff like that. They're going to get a bad name as a rap for being a bully and going after other companies for crap that they have no right to. And that's going to hurt them. Which sucks, because... Had they not done all of this to me, I would have been rooting for them to succeed. <laughs> I mean, they just instead of trying to be a bully and claim ownership to things you don't own, just make a good product. Just be a good company and make a good product and let the market decide. I mean, why do all this? You know, it's, it's sad, but it's the world we live in. <laughs> <laughs> Take as much as we can. Greed and selfishness. You know, it's, this the, it's the way of the world today. What are you going to do? That's why we can't have nice things. So, in the description below, check out the link for Lawful Masses. Um, I'll link to that video about this. Um, 
And if you have any questions, ask me down below. This is just an extra video I'm posting. I'm still going to post my video on Saturday for the Anycubic Wash and Cure, which, by the way, a little sneak peek, it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, I was skeptical about this thing when I got it. When they told me they were going to send it to me, I was like, you know, how is this going to be any better than the one I could build out of styrofoam? Uh, yeah, it's better. It's I was able to go from print to wash without getting dirty or messy anywhere. It's amazing. So that's it. I will see you guys in a couple days with my regularly posted video.